On today's mystery, which comes all the way from Sweden, it really teaches us that you can never be too careful with the life of your child. This is a case we call Lisa's Last Call. 17-year-old Lisa Holm was an intelligent and kind girl who was just about to make it into the real world. Then, all of a sudden, she disappears into thin air. A couple of days later, her body was found discarded in a workshed. What happened to Lisa? This is the true story of Lisa Holm. Her disappearance, the search for her, as well as the trial and conviction of Nerejus Bolivicius, her gruesome killer. Lisa Holm was born on the 7th of February in the year 1998. She grew up in the small, colorful town of Skovda in Sweden where she lived with her family. She was kind, caring, loved music and animals, and loved spending a lot of time with her friends. Knowing Lisa was simply to love her because everyone that knew her described her as an amazing girl with a heart of gold. She never missed an opportunity to be there for her friends. Most of all, Lisa had many plans for the future. Lisa had just graduated from high school and started a new job at a cafe in Blomberg. The cafe was just a 45-minute drive from her hometown, and it was only meant to be a summer job before she eventually went on to study social sciences in college, her dad bought her a moped as a graduation present. With her new moped, Lisa had some sort of independence and would be able to commute to her new job on her own. It was truly an exciting time for 17-year-old Lisa. The world was opening up to her, and it was most likely the happiest she had ever been. She had no prior experience with the moped, so for two weeks, Lisa and her father had traveled back and forth for her shifts at the cafe. This was quality bonding time for them, and at the same time, he was helping her to become very good at driving the scooter on her own. Lisa was finally a confident driver and was excited to set out on her own. On Sunday, the 7th of June 2015, Lisa set off for work alone for the first time. She was on the closing shift that day and made it there with little time to spare. It was just like every other day, really. Her shift went on as was to be expected. She interacted with the customers politely, laughed and chatted with her colleagues. It was just your average uneventful day at work work, but sadly danger was already peeking in from the shadows. By 6 p.m., Lisa and her colleagues began to close up for the day. By 6.23, she texted her father to let him know that she was about to leave the cafe. Lisa was about to head home, most likely proud of how successful her first day as an independent woman had been. Not long after, Lisa's father received a call from her, but going off the cheerful talks and laughter in the background, he assumed it was only a pocket dial. Unfortunately, this would be the last time her father would would ever hear her voice. The journey from the cafe to Lisa's home should have taken around 40 to 45 minutes, but by 7.30, Lisa was not home yet. As you can imagine, her parents got worried and began to call her, but all attempts to reach her repeatedly went straight to voicemail. As the minutes flew by, the worry turned into anxiousness. Something had happened to Lisa. The daughter would never intentionally stay away without calling to check in. Her father then left the house. In an attempt to find Lisa, he drove along the route that she was supposed to take home. He made sure to check every roadside ditch in the event that Lisa had been in an accident. However, Lisa was nowhere to be found. Even when he got to the cafe, he was heartbroken to learn that there was no sign of her. What he did find was the moped outside the cafe. There was not even a single moment of relief, because finding her keys still in the ignition was solidifying proof that Lisa was in danger. No matter what, Lisa would have never left her keys in the scooter carelessly. He frantically searched the cafe and the surrounding areas, but it was all to no avail. That was when he called the police. Upon arrival, the police launched a preliminary investigation. They searched the area for any sign of the missing girl and questioned people around the area who knew Lisa, but nobody was off much help. Because of her father's testimony, the police knew that they were looking at a case of abduction and not that of a runaway. With the help of police dogs, they searched the surrounding areas. They came across a conspicuous-looking barn that was across the cafe, but did not find anything around it. They proceeded to knock on the doors of local residents in hopes of any information that could help the search, but there were no leads whatsoever. The search lasted all through the night and continued into the morning of Monday, the 8th of June. After a fruitless overnight search, the police released a statement to inform the public that a teenage girl was missing. At the time, Lisa's name was not revealed because they felt they had already given all the information that the public needed to assist the investigation. That same day, the police made a distressing discovery. They found a moped glove in the same odd barn that was opposite the cafe. After testing, the glove was confirmed to be Lisa's. This was the same barn that had been searched by the police and the search dogs the night before. So how did this glove turn up the next day? Some farm workers found it and handed it over to the landlord. This landlord then handed it over to the police with the hope that he might aid
delayed the search. Unfortunately, the chain of custody for the glove could not be ascertained, and since it was from an unreliable source, any forensic evidence that may have been recovered from it was invalidated. However, the discovery of the glove did one thing. It changed the course of the investigation, such that it was upgraded to a top priority, allowing the authorities to use all available resources. More officers were added to the case, and the search parties also became larger. A command centre was also established at the Kelby Sports Ground near the cafe. The gloves were not the only trace of Lisa that would be found. A few hundred metres south of the cafe, the officers discovered what appeared to be the contents of Lisa's pockets that day. A mobile phone case, two old receipts, a used metro ticket and a smashed mobile phone screen. Her phone screen was smashed, but it was an indication that they were making progress on the case. The items had been found on a small gravel road, more like a path really, and it is so small that the police were convinced that only a local could possibly have known about the existence of that path. What was Lisa doing there? Clearly, she couldn't have made her way there on her own. Finding that smashed mobile phone confirmed her parents' worst fears, but the police were optimistic they could use her cell phone to track Lisa's movements from that day. Unfortunately, when they triangulated her phone, they came to a dead end. Lisa's last known location was the cafe, but there was no activity after that. This told the investigators that she must have been told to switch off her mobile or it was taken from her. So far, there has been no good news. Lisa's family, friends, and two colleagues were all interviewed again, but there were still no new leads. Lisa's classmates came together to set up a memorial site for her. From all accounts, Lisa was just a normal 17-year-old girl living in a small town. She didn't have any enemies, and such abductions were also uncommon. The following day, being Tuesday the 9th of June, some more of Lisa's belongings were discovered. Lisa's house keys and driver's license were found in the area, but still, there was no sign of Lisa. The search teams went in harder that day. The mineral wells were emptied, surrounding buildings were scoured, and all farmlands were thoroughly swept. They left no stone unturned, hoping they could find something that would point them in the right direction. Time was running out. With each passing day, the chances of finding Lisa grew lesser. By Wednesday, the 10th of June, together with Lisa's family, the police finally made the call to release Lisa's identity to the public. Following the press conference, almost a thousand people from across Sweden joined the search parties. In fact, this search party that showed up for Lisa is the largest Sweden has ever seen. They immediately returned to the places the police had already searched. One of these places is the barn. This time, they found one of Lisa's earrings near the entrance. The police then narrowed in on the barn. A forensics team was brought in to gather as much information as they could from the barn. The forensics team discovered human feces around the area, and this sample was taken in because it was believed to actually belong to the person responsible for Lisa's disappearance. It is possible that the culprit was experiencing an immense adrenaline rush from whatever he was doing, and felt the uncontrollable urge to empty the bowels. If this was the case, then the investigators knew that whatever must have happened to Lisa was most likely a motiveless crime for the thrill of it. Now that there was a reason to focus on the barn, the forensic investigators expanded the search to a five-kilometer radius. Within the area are several farms and residences, but the case made headway when they reached a particular Martop farm just a few kilometers from the cafe. While sweeping through the farm, two men drove in with a car. They informed the investigators that the farm had already been examined. It was pretty much a do not waste your time kind of comment, and it immediately made the search party volunteers suspicious, and they called the police. When the police arrived, they continued the search on the farm. They found Lisa's jacket, her helmet, and earphones hidden under some twigs and foliage. Searching further led them to an old wooden trailer on the property. Wooden trailer or work shed that looked like it had been recently accessed. The long grass leading up to it was flattened or pushed down. Unfortunately, when they entered the trailer, they picked up that unmistakable smell of death. It appeared to be some sort of old changing room because it had a lot of benches and lockers inside. The lockers were closed except for one that's full of old clothes. They forced the others open, but they found nothing. They knew something was there, but they couldn't find it. Eventually, they returned to the first open locker and went through the stuffed clothes, only to uncover what everyone had been dreading. Left behind in that cramped, narrow space was Lisa Holm. She was found 
stone dead and was only half dressed with a rope around her neck and duct tape over her mouth and nose. This discovery ended the five day search, and the autopsy would later reveal that Lisa died the night she disappeared. On Friday, the 12th of June, the police stormed into the house at the Marta farm. They arrested a 25 year old man, his wife, and his brother Neri Juice Bilavicious. They worked as laborers on the Marta farm and as such had access to the barn by the cafe. Their house also led directly onto the gravel road where Lisa's belongings had been discarded. All three denied knowing anything about Lisa's murder and they acted as alibis for each other. As you can imagine, there was now growing criticism that the police had not been thorough enough when they first searched the barn. Amidst these criticisms and public uproar, the barn was investigated again. This time they recovered evidence of sexual gratification on the wall. With hindsight, the barn had a large window with a very clear view of the cafe. Lisa's co-workers at the cafe confirmed that both of the brothers were usually spotted looking into the cafe from that window. The samples on the wall were tested for DNA, which was found to have a positive match with Naregis. In what appeared to be a milking room inside the barn, there was a pipe sticking out of the wall with a rope on it. Sticking out of the wall with a rope on it. This later tested positive for Lisa's DNA. This is where she is thought to have taken her final breaths. DNA was found on the pipe and it belonged to Lisa. According to the evidence, this milking room is where Lisa took her last breath. As heartbreaking as the situation was, the police could finally piece together the gruesome timeline of Lisa's murder. Neri just must have pulled up in the car just as Lisa was getting on her moped. It is likely that he quickly grabbed her and took her to the barn, where he silenced her with duct tape. And lastly, he suspended her from the pipe in the milking room. Even even though an autopsy determined that Lisa had not been violated, this attack is still believed to be carnally motivated. Because there were male fluids found on all of her clothes and in the barn, the investigators believed that Neregius was so aroused that he gratified himself while Lisa was taking her final breaths. After she died, Neregius moved her to the trailer on the Martup farm. He left her in that locker and tried to dispose of her belongings along the way. A senseless attack followed up by an even more senseless attempt to cover it up. Neregius thought he had a rock-solid alibi until his brother folded and told the police everything that happened the night Lisa died. Naregis had returned home, put all his clothes in the washing machine, and strangely asked his brother to lie for him if the police ever asked. Fast forward to November 2015, the case went to trial. But 2015, the case went to trial. The prosecutors argued that Naregis had kidnapped Lisa so that he could intimately violate her. When police seized his computers, they discovered a lot of dark and disturbing adult films on there. The prosecutors emphasized that suspending Lisa, the way he did from the pipe in the milking room, was simply for his own gratification. He was clearly trying to reenact one of the disturbing films on his computer. His actions afterward also indicate that he must not have considered this crime. After getting the experience he wanted, he tried to hide what he had done. The prosecution made sure to drive this point home. To everyone's surprise, the defense tried to push the blame onto his younger brother. The defense argued that his brother, planted all the evidence against him to cover his own tracks. They argued that there was no DNA found in the car, so there was no way Nerejus could have transported Lisa's body. It was a valid point, one that makes for a good argument. Needless to say, everyone was thankful when it did not hold up against all the other evidence that was stacked against him. When given the chance to speak, Nerejus had denied ever meeting Lisa. In his own words, I have not ever met this girl. I have only seen her picture. I know how difficult it must be for the family and I suffer with them as well. I myself am a father. But none of these words mattered. His DNA was all over Lisa, whereas there was nothing of his brother found anywhere near the crime scene. On the 17th of November 2015, a verdict was finally reached. Nerejus was found guilty and was sentenced to life in prison for his crime. Sweet justice was served. The defense attorney Bjorn Hertig later submitted a filing at the Court of Appeals on the 15th of April 2016. Hertig's reasons to appeal his client's sentence were given as someone else having helped or committed the murder and removed the body of Lisa Holm, such as the convict's wife. On the 2nd of May 2016, the Court of Appeals declined to grant a new review or trial. As a result, the life sentence of Nerejus became final. Nerejus was a monster who took the life of the very beautiful and kind Lisa. As such, he needed to be locked up far away from society, where he could never harm anyone like Lisa again. Although he was set to spend the rest of his life in prison, it turned out that the rest of his life would not be very long. On the 3rd of August 2022, 
Nerigius was stabbed in the neck with a makeshift knife by another inmate serving a life sentence. Even this is not enough to make up for the loss of Lisa Holm, and it certainly does not take away the pain that he caused her family and friend, but at the very least, they will find comfort in the fact that he will never be able to harm anyone else ever again.